Hello and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Campbell and uh, this is the first lecture in a series of video presentations that I'm going to be doing about the early age of discovery. Uh, that is the, the age of European exploration from the, uh, the 1400s and the Portuguese uh, and Italian uh, Spanish periods up to probably around 1600, getting into the French and English exploration. So we're going to have a lot of interesting things to talk about. Um, in this particular uh, lecture, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the reckoning that Christopher Columbus used to get to the New World. Now, we all know that Columbus found America by accident while searching for a Western route to, uh, to China. Uh, he calculated that the, the Western Sea was actually smaller than it was. And this lecture is about how did Columbus arrive at his figures? Why did he think that the, the Atlantic Ocean was, was much smaller? Uh, why, why did he think the Western Sea was smaller than it was? Why did he think it was possible to get to China in a reasonable amount of time by going west? Now, it's easy to, to rip on Christopher Columbus. People, especially today, like to give Columbus a hard time. And part of this is because I think nobody likes the idea of giving honor and praise to someone whose greatest achievement was, was done uh, on accident, essentially. Uh, Columbus was not looking for the new world. He died never knowing that he had discovered a new continent. So why is he, why is he praiseworthy? Let's let's remind ourselves though. Columbus was a talented mariner. He had been he had been all around on many voyages. He'd been to Iceland. He'd been all over the place. He was about as skilled a navigator as you got for those days. I remember he found his way to to uh, America by dead reckoning, essentially on a route that no one had ever taken. Secondly, and this is what we have to remember: even though he discovered America on accident, Columbus was essentially right in his fundamental. Uh, assumptions. That is, you could get east by going west. The Western Sea was smaller than people thought. Uh, he, of course, smaller because there was two continents in the way. But his fundamental premises were uh, were correct. Uh, so even if he was wrong in some of his assumptions, he got the big picture right. But in this lecture, we want to look at what he got wrong and why he got it wrong. So this really goes back to uh, Columbus's sources for why he got his calculations the way he did. This goes back to the ancient Greeks. Now, it was the ancient Greeks who, uh, who sometime, nobody knows who did it, but calculated a degree as 1 360th of a circle as a unit of measurement. So the Greeks are the ones that took the circle, broke it up into 360 degrees, and made a degree a unit of measurement, a degree of a sphere. Everyone knew the world was spherical. The ancient Greeks knew it, the medievals knew it, and the way they knew this was, was fairly straightforward from observation, uh, from, the, from the, the shadow on the moon during an eclipse, from the fact that different stars uh, were visible from different parts of the world, which would only make sense if the world was spherical. So everyone knew the world was a sphere, and everyone knew that a sphere could be broken up into 360 degrees, so the question was how big was one degree? And this was first estimated by the Greek uh, mathematician slash librarian Eratosthenes around 200 BC. He was the librarian at the Great Library of Alexandria in Egypt. And Eratosthenes calculated one degree using meridian observations of the sun uh, from the bottom of a well at, at two distant points in Syene and Alexandria. And based, uh, and it's pretty, pretty impressive using just the sun and shadows from two different locations uh, about 500 miles apart. Based on his observations, he calculated, estimated that a degree was about 59.5 nautical miles. Now this is very close. One degree is actually 60 nautical miles. So he was only one half of a nautical mile off. A nautical mile, by the way, is 1.15 uh, uh, conventional miles. So very close, but um, still a little bit inaccurate. This means that Eratosthenes' Earth was a bit smaller than the reality, although only by about 500 miles. So Eratosthenes' estimation for the circumference of the Earth is about 500 miles 
smaller than the real thing. So we have a, we're starting with a smaller globe. Now, probably the most important uh, error in estimating the size of the Earth came from Claudius Ptolemy, the, uh, the Roman um, geographer in the second century AD. Ptolemy uh, estimated that the, um, the distance from Cape St. Vincent in modern-day Portugal to the coast of China was 177 degrees. That is 177 of Eratosthenes degrees. Now, the real distance between those two locations is 131 degrees. So this makes a difference of about 3,150 miles uh, in real life. So the result is that Eratosthenes gave us a smaller spherical Earth, and on that smaller sphere, Ptolemy estimates Eurasia to be 13% bigger than it is by about 3,150 miles. In other words, uh, the Earth, in the view of the ancient Romans, is much more covered by land than it really is. Now, the calculations go even more awry when we get to the second century AD uh, mathematician Marinus of Tyre. Uh, Marinus of Tyre, which is in, in Lebanon, he would interview uh, caravans that were returning from China, and he would ask them information about their trips to China. Uh, specifically, he wanted them to, uh, to estimate uh, how long it took their camels to, to get there. Now, they said that it took their camels about seven months, and they estimated that the camel walked 20 miles a day. Now, Marina simply took 20 miles a day for seven months and estimated that the distance, the, 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 the expanse of Eurasia was actually 225 degrees, which is 48 more degrees than Ptolemy's already overblown estimate. Uh, this is going to make the Eurasian landmass uh, 6,642 miles longer from east to west than it actually is. Now, Columbus um, relied on the reckoning of Ptolemy and Marinus of Tyre. He loved Marinus of Tyre's uh, calculations because if Marinus of Tyre was correct, then in fact the earth was 63% uh, covered by land going east to west, leaving only 37% water. This encouraged Columbus to think that a westward journey to China was possible in a very reasonable amount of time. Now, uh, Marinus of Tyre, Ptolemy were not the only ancient authorities that thought this. The Roman geographer Strabo of the first and second centuries also used these calculations to argue that a voyage from Spain to the Orient going west was theoretically possible. Uh, the Roman author and naturalist Seneca also argued that it was possible to sail west uh, to China using the calculations of, of Ptolemy and Eratosthenes. So this was a commonly held kind of uh, naturalistic assumptions of the Greco-Roman age that this was uh, possible. Now, the real question, though, was if you could get to the Orient by going west, would you take a southerly route or would you go a northern route? Uh, Tacitus, the Roman historian and geographer, had argued that um, such a voyage could not be made across the north because he, he said that the northern oceans were jellied or coagulated, that the consistency of the water was thicker and it would not, um, would not permit the passage of a, uh, of a vessel. Um, so this is not actually too far off when you consider the, the problems with packed ice when you get too far into the northern uh, latitude. So at any rate, um, the general Greco-Roman consensus that the Western Ocean was smaller than it was, the, uh, the Roman geographical uh, opinion that you could get to the Orient by going west, and Tacitus' idea that you shouldn't do this by a northerly route kind of helped Columbus fix his uh, voyage going west on a more, uh, more southerly route. Now, finally, we don't want to underestimate the importance of a biblical text, well, I should say a uh, apocryphal text. There was a apocryphal uh, biblical text uh, popular in the late Middle Ages, uh, the book of Esdras. And 2 Esdras chapter 6, verse 42 says the following, quote, Upon the third day thou didst command that the waters should be gathered into the seventh part of the earth. Six parts thou hast dried up and kept them, end quote. 
So according to 2nd Ezra 6.42, the earth is divided into seven portions, and God has allotted six of these portions for land and only a seventh for water. So this means if you were to know the distance from, uh, from the tip of Europe to the tip of China, that would represent six-sevenths of the earth, and the remaining ocean would only be uh, one-seventh, so you could calculate that, that distance. Columbus, uh, being a, a devoted Christian, um, gave credence to what was found in the book of Second Esdras, though, of course, this book isn't canonical, but it was very popular, and uh, Columbus believed that it did have some sort of knowledge, some sort of uh, arcane knowledge about the... Uh, the uh, geographical properties of the world. So we can see, taking this text of 2nd Esdras, the consensus of people like Tacitus, Strabo, uh, why, uh, Seneca, why Columbus thought the ocean was as small as it was. Now, um, if, uh, if we take Eratosthenes' degrees and we take what it says in 2nd Esdras, that only one-seventh of the earth is water, then according to that reckoning, the ocean would only be 3,000 521 miles across. Now, the interesting thing, the distance of Columbus's voyage from Palo, Spain to, uh, well, nobody knows exactly where he landed, but to Hispaniola is actually 4,055 miles, only 534 miles off from what he estimated. So again, the distance across the ocean was very close to what Columbus thought it was. Now, not to China, that was the big surprise, not to China, but to the American continents. But at any rate, again, Columbus was essentially right. The distance across the Atlantic to land was smaller than what, his, what many contemporaries thought it was. You could ultimately get east by going west. Uh, so uh, he was essentially right. And we can see why he used the reckoning that he did. It all goes back to the calculations of Eratosthenes, the error of Ptolemy in assuming the Eurasian landmass was 177 degrees when it's only 131, and then the even more overblown, uh, exaggerated distance reckoned by Marinus of Tyre of, uh, of um, 225 degrees when it's really 131. So we can see why Columbus reckoned as he did and why he thought this voyage to China going west was possible. And also it shows that Columbus was no, no bumbler. I mean, he was equipped with years and years of experience planning, and he had the best scientific data then available. So let's give Columbus some credit. How would you do dead reckoning your way across the Atlantic Ocean today when we already know where everything is, let alone in the year 1492? So it's something to think about. Anyhow, I hope this was enlightening for you, and uh, join me again uh, next time for more lectures on the Age of Discovery.